Okay, good afternoon. Um, my name is David Clark. I'm a professor in the economics department. I'm also a member of the, uh, the Marburg uh, Selection Committee. And, uh, you know, the annual Marburg lecture is uh, really one of the highlights of the academic calendar for, um, for the College of, of Business and, and also for the economics department. And so we certainly look forward to hearing this year's uh, speaker, Professor uh, Ed Glazer from, from Harvard uh, University. But before we begin, uh, just uh, a, couple, a couple of things I wanted to, to comment on. Um, you know, the obligatory please turn off your, your cell phones or at least silence them uh, is, uh, is certainly something we want to, to do. Um, and uh, so, so, so let me, uh, let me say, uh, say a few things before we get going. So on behalf of Marquette University and, and the College of Business and the Center for Global and Economic Studies, I want to, to, to welcome you all uh, to the uh, 2014 uh, Marburg uh, Memorial Lecture. We have a full house today, uh, and we, we uh, uh, certainly have, have um, uh, a few extra seats down here, so, so as people filter in, please, please uh, feel free to, to, to make room for them. Um, we want to welcome certainly the students. Uh, we have uh, an awful lot of students here today, uh, faculty, uh, guests of the university, um, members of the university administration. Uh, that includes uh, Dr. Michael Lovell, uh, our president, and uh, uh, Dr. Mark Appley, the Keys Dean of, of uh, the College of Business. Um, I also want to recognize uh, uh, Milwaukee Mayor uh, Tom Barrett. Uh, he's he's uh, uh, been able to, to be with us today, and, and uh, the um, uh, development um, uh, uh, officer uh, Rocky Marcou is here as well. So, so, so welcome to them. Before I in, invite uh, President Lovell up uh, to, to uh, introduce our speaker, I'd like to, to give you a little bit of background about the, the Marburg Lecture itself. Um, this lecture series was, was actually established in the 1990s. Uh, by the Marburg family, right? Um, uh, they wanted to honor the legacy of, of uh, uh, Dr. Theodore Marburg. Uh, he was a former department chair in the economics department, and he was a longtime member of, of, of the department. He had a, a, a very strong legacy. Um, uh, in addition to being a great teacher, he actually won uh, one of our university uh, teaching awards. Um, he was a, an excellent scholar, and he was a, he was a great mentor to his his students as well. Um, so so uh, this lecture series was established uh, in his his honor. Um, the 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 research that that he did, his scholarship really focused on the way that the economic discipline uh, could be used to to number one uh, understand uh, how capitalistic uh, systems work, but but, but also uh, how they, uh, uh, how, how um, the, uh, the moral, philosophical, and, and social dimensions of society can be better understood. Um, so the, the Marburg Lecture Series was, was established uh, to, to further those types of discussions. Um, over the years, the, the lecture has, has hosted many fine speakers. You can look at the, the back of your program and and you'll certainly see uh, uh, some of the names that are, that are listed there. Uh, and we are delighted to have uh, Professor Glazer add his name to, to that list. Um, finally, just a, just a quick note on, on the format. I'd ask you to, to hold uh, your, your questions until um, the end of the, the talk. We'll have a Q&A period. Um, if you do have questions, we would ask that you uh, come to the, the microphone in the um, in the aisles and, and uh, ask your question uh, at that microphone. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Michael Lovell, uh, the newly installed 24th uh, president of Marquette University to the podium to introduce our 2014 Marburg lecture. Dr. Lovell. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Clark, and uh, for those visiting our campus, I want to welcome you along with our faculty and staff and students for participating in this really outstanding lecture series. Um, you know, our university's mission calls on us to search for truth and discover 
and share knowledge. In this lecture series, when you look at the individuals that have come to our campus and the things that they've discussed have really helped us along that path today. And I would argue that some of the most intriguing um, presentations that we've had at Marquette University over the years have come through this lecture series, so we should all be very proud of that. And um, you know, I think all of you that are part of the campus community have heard a lot since I've been here about how we can spur innovation and entrepreneurship and make a difference in the city of Milwaukee. <clears throat> And I've been very fortunate enough uh, to last week have gotten a copy of Dr. Glazer's book, uh, City of Triumph, uh, Triumph of the City, I believe is, yeah, Triumph of the City. Um, and I've been very happy to have made it through the introduction. I've not gotten through the whole thing yet. But, um, but what I've gleaned you know, from, from reading uh, just, just the beginning, first of all, he talk, it has a very positive, and there's really a feeling of hope about cities and, and how cities can uh, progress and, and really do great things. And uh, I think it's great that he came here today to share some of his perspectives on cities and how ideas are generated, uh, the importance of attracting and retaining startups in cities, how education and not necessarily infrastructure is the crucial ingredient for urban rebirth, um, and the significant significance of, of home growing your talent and keeping it here. And really, which I will always resonates with me, is the role universities play in helping cities become centers of idea transmission, and I would actually, I often argue that if you look at any area of the country that is doing well economically, there are universities that are helping drive that growth. And um, the one thing I, I really, again, I, I, when I just have, have read just a short bit, uh, one thing that really, again, struck me is that it, when, I'm, um, when I'm in Madison, I'm constantly arguing that investment in Milwaukee will go further than investments in the other part of the, of the state. Milwaukee is the solution. It's not the problem. And, uh, <laughs> and I believe that Dr. Glazer's book clearly articulates that, and uh, we couldn't be more excited to have him here. And by the way, uh, he is, we're not alone in wanting his perspectives on things. Uh, um, his, you know, his, his credits include recently being on NPR, uh, the Fox News, and the Daily Show, so clearly his perspective, perspectives are, are well sought after and thought of. And um, he joined Harvard University Department of Economics faculty in 1992, and in, nine, in 2005 he was named the Fred and Eleanor Glenn Professor of Economics. Uh, he also serves Harvard as director of the, of the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston, which is part of the John F. Kennedy School of Government. And as I mentioned before, his most recent book, Triumph City, uh, is what the title of the lecture is he's giving tonight. Uh, but he states in his book that cities are our greatest, um, species of our greatest invention. And he particularly talks, which again, I think it should be very important for all of us as we think about the role of Marquette University going forward, that the strength of the city comes from human collaboration. And so the talents and resources we have on this campus when we collaborate with others really can be part of fostering a stronger Milwaukee. So uh, will you please help me welcome one of the world's experts on cities and the role that they play in the economy, Dr. Edward Glazier. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind, those kind words. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Mary Barrett, for coming here. I'm, I'm really deeply honored that you chose to spend an hour with me. But the truth of the matter is, I'm deeply honored that all of you chose to spend an hour with me, because your time is incredibly precious. And I, I feel enormously lucky that you've given me 45 odd minutes to try and convince you of the things I believe I know about, about cities. Um, Gandhi famously said, that was our slide, huh? we're missing the slide. Gandhi famously said that the future of India lies in its villages, not in its cities and towns. But with all due respect to the great man on this one, he was completely and totally wrong. Because in fact, the future of India, like the future of the United States, like the future of China, is enormously urban. And that is really what we're here to discuss, is this remarkable change where now more than half of humanity lives in cities, and within your lifetimes, three quarters of humanity will live, will live in cities. And it's a hard not, when you think about that, hard not to think that that's a net a good thing. Because when you compare those countries that are more than 50% urbanized to those countries that are less than 50% urbanized, the more urbanized countries have on average incomes that are five times higher. And I think even more strikingly, infant mortality levels that are less than a third. 
Now, this is a portrait of the United States, and I, I call it a portrait to make it clear right from the start that I have absolutely no aesthetic sense whatsoever, like many economists. Um, and what I've done, though, is I've taken the 3,000 odd counties in the United States, and I've divided them into tenths. Each one of those dots represents 300 odd counties. I have ordered those counties on the basis of their density levels, people per square mile, because at their heart, Cities are the absence of physical space between people and firms. Cities are density, proximity, closeness. What you can see from the bottom line is the relationship between incomes and density. The densest tenth of America's counties have incomes that are on average 50% higher than the least dense half of America's counties. This is a well-documented phenomenon. Economists call this agglomeration economies. The fact that the three largest metropolitan areas in the United States produce 18% of America's GDP, while including only 13% of America's population. Um, now, of course, there is a lengthy economics literature attempting to figure out if this is a causal impact of density or something else. And I'm not going to go through all of that right now. But through a variety of statistical tools, whether it's looking at soil quality and its ability to support higher levels of density, or looking at migrants who come to cities who don't typically experience huge wage growth immediately, but what happens is year by year, month by month, they have faster wage growth as, as the years tick on, supporting the idea that there's something going on in cities that is impacting what they're learning and how productive they're becoming. At least my reading of the literature is that on net, you know, Two thirds, three quarters of this is actually reflecting a treatment effect of density. And if you want to sort of see that you know, treatment effect you know, away from the possibility that what's going on in cities is, is something about smarter people moving there, just look at how much people are willing to pay for real estate in downtown Tokyo or downtown New York City, right? Which is reflecting the fact that there's, you know, there are things going on, there's a maelstrom of activity that it is important, it is valuable to be near. Now, the top line shows something else, which is the relationship between population growth between the years 2000 and 2010 and initial population density. The places that started with the most empty land gained the least in terms of new people. The places that started over here with the, with the least free space gained the most people. So whereas Americans at the start of the 19th century were leaving their dense enclaves on the eastern seaboard to populate the empty spaces between the oceans, at the start of the 21st century, instead of spreading out, we are clustering in. Now, this is the same picture for Europe. It's a little bouncier. Uh, the blue line again shows GDP per capita. The thing that you may not realize, if, but you have to look at the scales, is in fact the densest tenth of these European regions, and this is across the entire EU, are earning about twice as much as the least dense regions. So in fact the relationship is even stronger in the EU than it is in the US. The red line shows the relationship between population growth 2000-2010 and initial population density for Europe. Again, the slope is clearly positive, although there, there is a little bit more jumping up and down. This is a global phenomenon. Um, Milwaukee is at this point in time also uh, a city that is clearly finding its paces and becoming successful. I was struck by the fact that Milwaukee's unemployment rate now is down to 5.4%. Right, the last time I gave a talk in Milwaukee, which is only nine months ago, it was at 6.9%. Now, those declines in unemployment rate partially reflect changes in the share of people who are in the labor force. And that's indeed something that we should all worry about. Right? When I was born in 1967, only one in 20 prime age males in the United States were jobless. Today that number is 17%, and that hasn't occurred primarily through the unemployment rate, it's occurred through labor force participation. But any way you look at it, Milwaukee has done quite well recently in terms of employing. Um, there's a $49,000 gross metropolitan product per capita in Milwaukee, which is slightly south of Chicago, but significantly above the US metropolitan average. Um, there's $47,000 payroll per worker according to county business patterns, which is again a perfectly solid number on the basis of a fairly diversified local urban economy. Um, it's a city that is remarkably diverse, right? 42% African American, 17% Hispanic. The poverty rate is still too high, 41% poverty rate for kids growing up in, in, in Milwaukee, 28%. Uh, for adults, but I think it is important when we think about urban poverty to remember that cities don't make people poor, at least not usually. Cities have poor people in part, in large part, because they attract poor people. They attract poor people with economic opportunity, with a better social safety net than many of the suburbs, 
and often with the ability to get around without a car for every adult. My own work with Matthew Kahn finds that when you build new subway stops in an area, poverty rates go up. That's not because the subways are impoverishing local residents, it's because they are attracting them. Um, and finally, the education level is about 20% with a college degree or higher, um, and 19% or so are college uh, high school dropouts, which is almost double the Detroit number, but still substantially less than, let's say, Seattle, a superstar of the information age, which has more than 50% of its adults with college degrees. Um, I had mentioned housing prices earlier. This is the housing price equivalent of density and income growth. So what I've done here is I've taken all the metropolitan areas in the US, and I've split them up on the basis of density levels into five bins. And we're looking at the entire 1996 to 2012 period. During this period, of course, America has experienced a huge housing market tsunami, right? And some regions, Sunbelt regions disproportionately, experienced huge price booms and then huge price busts. But if you look over the entire time period, there's one correlation which stands out strongly, which is those places that higher, had higher density levels initially had the overwhelming share of price growth between the 1996 and 2012 period. Um, this is another Gandhi quote, and this is my lead into my international data, but uh, I regard the growth of cities as an evil thing, unfortunate for mankind and the world. But when you think about India, right, and the developing world is really where the most exciting things in cities are currently happening. When you think about India, the future of India is not in cottage industries and small villages. It's in Mumbai and Bangalore and Delhi and Kolkata. It's in cities that are providing pathways out of poverty into prosperity and are changing the world. Right? It doesn't mean there aren't huge problems in these cities. It doesn't mean that in some sense the battle to tame these urban areas and make them livable isn't in some sense the great challenge of the 21st century. But there is no future in rural poverty. And indeed, Gandhi was wrong on this. Now, this is a somewhat more difficult graph. It's probably actually the hardest graph I'm going to, going to show you. But it actually gives you a sense of the nature of the problem that we face in terms of developing world urbanization. As great a phenomenon as it is, it is also a difficult phenomenon. Because the problems of urbanization can almost uniformly be handled with enough money and good governance. Right? But in places without even money or good governance, these problems become much more severe. And what we've seen over the past 50 years is a remarkable growth of urbanization even in very poor places. Now here's how you read this graph. I've taken bins of countries and I've separated them out in terms of income levels. These income levels are all in current dollars. So the bins four to $5,000 means that in 1960 uh, they were earning between 40 and 4,000, dollars or it's of course it's a different set of countries. In 2010, they're earning between four and five thousand dollars. Now, what I've now done is I've looked at the share of those countries that are at least one third urbanized, and that's what the bars show you. That the share of countries that have one third of the population or more living in cities. Where does one third come from? It's fairly arbitrary. It's just meant to be a relatively clean cutoff for saying, look, a fair number of people in the city live in the country live in cities. So what the three thousand to four thousand and four thousand to five thousand bars mean is that both in 1960 and today. If you're earning that kind of money, four to five thousand dollars, the majority of countries have over a third, you know, over a third urbanized, right? So about 80% of countries, both in 1960 and 2010, are more than one third urbanized at these at these levels. No big change there. Go down to the poorer countries. The starkest example is those countries with per capita incomes below a thousand dollars. Okay. What? How many of them? What share of those countries were more than one third urbanized in 1960? None. Not a single one. This bar is not a typo. Today, more than 40% of them are one-third urbanized. These are places like Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. These are places like Port-au-Prince in Haiti. These are places that have massive amounts of urbanization in a way that was unthinkable in the past, where to be poor meant to be rural, which is the history of humanity. But today, even very, very poor places have become urban, in some sense because the challenges of feeding those poor people, which America needed to solve before it became urban, right? I mean, America didn't become 50% urban until the 1920s, when our per capita income was $7,500, massively richer than these countries, $7,500 in current dollars. But because we had to feed our cities, because we had to move the food over space, but Port-au-Prince can be fed with rice coming out of New Orleans. It's a totally different model. And it means that there are possibilities in these countries for rapid change, for democratization that cities bring, but it also means that they have enormous challenges of dealing with the downsides of density. Now, again, and this is sort of the picture that you should have in mind, I view the favelas as, as a symbol of hope. Yes, there are places of tremendous crime. Yes, there are places of suffering. But when you do the numbers and you compare life in a favela of Rio with the right comparison group, which is life in the rural northeast of Brazil, you see that the people who come to these cities aren't fools. 
they're not making some serious mistake by urbanizing. Right? They're doing something quite logical. They're following opportunity. They're following promise. They're going to a place which has a better, better future for them. And the challenge is not the right response to the problems of big cities of the developing world is not to shut them down, but to try and figure out how to make them more livable. Um, one of the reasons that I believe this so strongly is that when you look at measures like self-reported life satisfaction or happiness, if you will, they typically show that people who live in urban areas in the developing world typically say that they are much happier than people who live in rural areas. This is the relationship between self-reported life satisfaction and urbanization across countries in the world. And as you can see, there's a robust positive relationship. More urbanized countries have people who say that they're happier. And this is true even holding for income. But this is the graph showing the difference between urban and rural happiness and income. And as you can see, in relatively wealthy countries, there's really no gap. Right? Urban and rural residents are basically the same. There's no relationship between metropolitan area size and self-reported happiness across the United States today. And I'll show you that map in a second. But in poorer countries, and every point that's above zero there means that the respondents in rural areas say that they are much less happy than people in urban areas, right? Are in those poor areas in India and Mali and Ghana and Moldova and Rwanda, the urbanites are saying that they're significantly more satisfied with their life than the people who live in rural areas. There are some exceptions. Thailand, of course, big negative stuff. You know, traffic in Bangkok is hell. Uh, and uh, of course, Iraq. Now, this is data from 2005 to 2007. So with, there were some negative shocks happening in urban Iraq that may have had something to do with low levels of life satisfaction uh, there. Uh, this is a US map of, uh, of happiness across, uh, across areas. Um, and as you can see, there are, you know, uh, there are pockets of unhappiness, particularly associated with urban decline. Declining cities tend to have people who say that they're less happy. When you drill down on the data, it turns out that these places, take for example Scranton, uh, Pennsylvania, were actually less happy in the 1940s too. They were, the unhappiness precedes decline. And it looks more as if what's happening is that people are moving away from areas which, where self-reported life satisfaction levels were, were, uh, were lower, rather than that the self-reported life satisfaction levels are responding to urban, to urban decline. Um, I think it's also important to be a little bit careful on these numbers, because in fact, these also reflect various cultural norms in various places. So New York actually has very low levels of self-reported life satisfaction, right? And in fact, no self-respecting New Yorker is going to tell an interviewer how happy they are with your life. You might as well admit you're an idiot right there on the phone, right? I mean, I say this as, as a New Yorker. But still, at the same time, suicide levels are incredibly low in New York City, right? So the sort of revealed preference model of happiness suggests that these, these guys aren't, uh, uh, aren't that miserable. OK, so happiness, incomes, high housing prices, massive urbanization. This is a world in which you know, cities are incredibly important and becoming more so. And in some sense, this is a paradox, because we live in an age in which distance is dead, in which we could all effortlessly telecommute in from whatever woodsy spot appealed to our love of nature. And yet, in so many ways, in so many places, we choose the inconveniences of urban density. 30 years ago, the cyber seers and the techno prophets predicted that all of this information technology was going to make face-to-face -face contact and the cities that enable that contact obsolete. And yet it didn't. Why didn't that happen? I'm going to pause on that and let you, let you think about it, but I'm going to come back to it later. But in some sense, it's the central paradox of this talk, which is why didn't long distance communication make cities obsolete? And why does it seem as if the trends are in fact favoring urbanization rather than moving away from it? Now, this rosy view of cities is very different from the New York City of my youth, right? These are two iconic images from New York City in the 1970s, where the city was really deeply troubled. New York had been shedding manufacturing jobs by the hundreds of thousands during the late 1960s. It's easy to forget now, but the largest industrial cluster in the United States in the 1950s was not automobile production in Detroit. It was garment production in New York City. And that cluster was hammered by globalization in the 1960s. Accompanying the deindustrialization of the city was mounting social chaos, crime rates that were soaring precipitously. City budgets had gotten out of control with this combination of both the economic base weakening and the social problems rising. And it really felt by the mid-1970s that not just President Ford, but history itself was telling New York and all of the older, colder cities of the, of the US to drop dead. It really felt as if they were dinosaurs. You know, and this is Boston as well as Buffalo, Seattle, right, as well as Detroit. All of these places looked as if their time had come and gone, and we would be looking forward to a non-urban future where 
you know, and you can see President Carter wandering through the wasteland that the South Bronx had become, where once proud buildings would be claimed up by weeds that would come out of the ground and tear them down, and someday we'd look forward to a future where the Statue of Liberty would come peeking out of the sand like the end of the Planet of the Apes. Um, now, in some sense, urban futures seemed so bleak in the 1970s because cities had lost their original reason for being. Every one of America's older, colder cities, Milwaukee included, right, came about as part of solving a transportation problem. If you go back to the start of the 19th century, Americans sat on the edge of this vastly wealthy continent filled with tremendous natural resources that were virtually inaccessible. It cost as much to ship goods 30 miles over land in 1816 as it did to ship them across the entire Atlantic Ocean. Right? And so we sat perched on the eastern seaboard, clinging to our Atlantic watery lifeline, um, unable to access this wealth. And then over the course of the 19th century, we built this amazing transportation network. First and most importantly, canals, Erie, Illinois, and Michigan. Um, and then, of course, we built railroads that supplemented the canals. And cities grew up on pinch points of the transportation network. Right? They grew up around the movement of goods. So think about Joseph Dart's pioneering elevators, which lifted the grain coming on the boats that plied the Great Lakes and lifted it onto the boats that went along the Erie Canal. Or think of Chicago, the linchpin of a great watery arc that went all the way from New York to New Orleans, a city whose property markets went mad in the 1830s when Illinois committed to building the Illinois and Michigan Canal. And what are they doing in Chicago? Well, of course, they're building an industry around transportation. Um, this is, of course, Chicago's you know, ur industry of the 19th century. It's actually the second largest industry by employment relative to garment, after garment production. It's the largest in terms of value added. It is the stockyards. So the stockyards are part of solving a transportation problem, and that problem is moving corn. Okay? America, in the 19th century, as in today, has a fantastic comparative advantage at growing corn, even without utterly benighted Department of Agriculture subsidies. Oh, that's going to get me a lot of trouble in Wisconsin. Uh, forget, forget that I said that. But even without utterly benighted D of A corn subsidies, um, we would be fantastic at growing corn. The problem with corn is that it has a very low value per ton. And so it's expensive to ship. So in the course of the 19th century, right, expensive to ship per dollar of, of product. So in the course of the 19th century, we transformed corn into other products which had a high value per ton or easier to ship. Of course, that started off when the farmers of Western Pennsylvania transformed corn and other grains into that potable and portable product of whiskey, which of course got them in some trouble over tax payments with President Washington. Um, that then moved to the farmers of the Ohio River Valley, who in Cincinnati, known as America's Porkopolis, right, transformed corn into salted pork. And pigs are, of course, corn with feet. That's what pigs are. And for some reason, in that refrigerated era, right, in the pre-refrigerated era, human beings have always been fonder of salted pork than salted beef. I have no economic theory for why this is. I think it's about sweetness and salt. But if you go into your grocers, grocers today, you will find a thousand products involving salted pork and you know, maybe some brazala if you live somewhere very fancy, and maybe some corned beef if you don't. But you know, if, Porkopolis is in the era of pre-refrigeration. Then, of course, you get refrigerated rail cars thanks to this innovator armor. And, of course, the great innovation with refrigerated rail cars is you put the blocks of ice on top of the dressed beef, not below it. So the cold water melts and keeps the uh, beef cold during the long journey to market. And, of course, a whole industry rises around slaughtering the cattle. So you move the cattle on the hoof to Chicago. You can see them. They're right there. They're alive, right? And they're being slaughtered there in Chicago and then put in refrigerated rail cars to the east. This manages to both take advantage of scale economies, right, and minimize transportation costs. Now, this is also obviously tied to Milwaukee's past, right? This is also a city that's built around connections with a great agricultural hinterland of America, built around water, not just one river, but two, right? Uh, and on top of that, built around the Great Lakes. Right, this is the Milwaukee story in the 19th century. And also like Chicago, it's a city that is built on immigrants, that is built on connections to the old world that then creates a rich cultural heritage. Now, everything that I've said so far about cities makes it sound as if cities are about solving some operations research problem, as if somebody in the Pentagon could sit down and say, well, where do I put the stockyards to minimize the cost and figure out the whole thing? And yeah, there is some part of that in cities. But it's not the part of cities that's really magical. 
The part of cities that's magical occurs in the chains of collaborative creativity that occur when smart people learn from one another. It shows up in these miraculous things, you know, when Plato and Socrates bicker on an Athenian street corner, or think about 15th century Florence, right, where Brunelleschi figures out the basic mathematics of linear perspective, how to make two-dimensional spaces appear to be three-dimensional, passes it along to Donatello, right, who puts it in low-relief sculpture on the wall of Orson Michele in Florence, right, um, passes it along to Masaccio, the Brancacci Chapel, marvelous picture of St. Peter finding a silver coin in the belly of a fish, passes it along to that, I'm sorry to say, particularly of Marquette, that less than saintly monk, Fra Filippo, Fra Filippo Lippi, uh, who passes along to Botticelli and so forth, a chain of genius, each person riffing on each other's idea, collaboratively making something great, not necessarily for pure motives, but because they're trying to figure out something brilliant and they're leveraging the talent of those people around them. Well, a similar chain of genius occurs in Chicago in the 1880s, right? Which has this cluster of brilliant architects who have come there after the great fire to rebuild the city. Uh, and that cluster of genius, of course, gives us that quintessential urban thing, the skyscraper. This is Chicago's home insurance building known by many architectural historians as the world's first skyscraper, meaning a tall building with a load-bearing steel or cast iron skeleton. Right? In that sense, a skyscraper is a very different thing than just a tall building. And in fact, at the same time as home insurance, London builds St. Pancras Station, which you can go see right now, which is a taller building. But St. Pancras Station's load is not held up by an elegant steel, steel skeleton. It's held up by massive load-bearing walls. And you can see the marvelous renovation of St. Pancras today. They've got walls like a medieval fortress, right, carrying this thing up. Whereas this, this is a picture of things to come. Its creator, William Byron Jenny, its architect, is, also called, is often called the father of the skyscraper. But predictably, there is a lively architectural history debate about whether or not he deserves this sobriquet and whether or not this thing is, in any sense, the world's first skyscraper. Because, of course, there were industrial buildings, there were commercial buildings with steel skeletons long before home insurance. Because, in fact, this is not a complete skyscraper. Only the front two walls have a load-bearing steel skeleton. The back two walls are traditional load-bearing walls. Um, and because, of course, there were plans for similar skyscrapers that were being bandied about Chicago in the early 1880s by people other than Jenny, right? So is Jenny the father of skyscraper? Is Louis Sullivan? Is Adler? Is Root? Um, is Peter B. White the great fireproofing engineer who helped them all? Which of these characters deserves the credit as being the, uh, is Daniel Burnham the father of the skyscraper? You can actually go online and you'll find any number of people arguing for various perspectives on it. I submit to you that any attempt to isolate a single father of the skyscraper is a fool's errand. Because the skyscraper, like pretty much everything else our species has ever done, is a collaborative invention which had involved all of these people, supplying each other with parts, with ideas, um, sharing, sharing builder, building tools together. They learn from each other. It is Chicago, in a sense, that is the real parent of the skyscraper, probably a mother rather than a father, but is the collaboration of genius that occurs from smart people who work together. I mean, Burnham and Sullivan were both apprentices together in, in uh, Jenny's office, for goodness sakes. Right? This is how creativity works. This is how we become smart by being around other smart people. A similar chain of genius occurs in Detroit 10 years later. Detroit, Detroit, classic inland port, right? Detroit, the Straits. And of course, Detroit would have industries like Detroit Dry Dock, a firm that specialized in making cutting edge ships that plied the Great Lakes with cutting edge engines. And this firm also became a, you know, furnace of build for creating human capital. Young farm boys like this character came to Detroit and got their start working on engines at Detroit Dry Dock. This young, young farm boy is, of course, Henry Ford, who then moves on to work with Thomas Alva Edison and then joins the great American race of the 1890s of trying to figure out how to produce an inexpensive car. Of course, Ford is hardly alone. Right? Detroit in the 1890s feels a lot like Silicon Valley in the 1960s. There's a genius on every street corner. It's the Dodge brothers, the Fisher brothers, David Dunbar Buick, um, Billy Durant, Ransom E. Olds, right? A chain of genius, all of whom knew each other, all of whom supplied each other with parts, with ideas, with uh, financing, right? And collectively, they did it. Collectively, they created a cheap car. In the short run, this invention was incredibly beneficial for both Detroit and probably for humanity as a whole. Right? Cars enabled far from American farmers to gain mobility, to connect with one another. Ford's factory paid five-hour days, a princely sum for the time period. They, this factory made Detroit probably the most productive place on the planet by the 1940s, and indeed those factories helped America win World War II. Right? In the short run, this was an amazing achievement. But when you think about the long run, 
Successful cities at the start of the 19th century were built on three things, smart people, small firms, and connections to the outside world. The same three things make for successful cities at the start of the 21st century. How far away from that is Ford's River Rouge factory? A vast, vertically integrated plant walled off from the outside world, employing tens of thousands of Americans with very little formal skilling. It's not that this is not a great thing for short-run productivity. But this thing doesn't integrate with the city. It doesn't need the city. It doesn't give to the city. It isn't part, in some sense, of fabric, the give and take of city life. And when cost conditions change, these large, vertically integrated factories, you just move them to where things are cheaper. It happened that, in fact, Detroit was still a really good place to make cars in 1925. Right, because it had the Great Lakes, because it had access to a variety of inputs. It was a lousy place to make cars by 1975. Cost conditions were very high, declining transportation costs, made possible in part by those cars, but also by a global decline in the cost of moving goods. This is a decline in moving a ton of mile by rail in real dollars over the 20th century, 90% drop. So whereas it was really valuable to have access to the Great Lakes in 1910, it was irrelevant by 1970. And so firms moved to cheaper locations. First they suburbanized, then they moved to lower cost states. The work of Tom Holmes at the University of Minnesota, comparing counties on the, so the pro-business side of state lines with counties on the pro-labor side of state lines, finds a huge difference in industrial growth on those counties on the pro-business side of state lines. Right? Um, the move to the Sun Belt owes something to do with this. And of course, manufacturing moved to lower cost locales. Right? And cities suffered. Uh, one way to see these declining transportation costs is what happened was that they freed people up to move no longer to areas in which firms had a productive advantage, like access to the coal mines outside of, of Pittsburgh, but rather to places where people wanted to live. And the variable that best predicts metropolitan area growth in the 20th century is January temperature. Um, which I think tells you that those retiring Midwestern farmers in 1900 really wanted a place that was a little less cold uh, than where they had grown up. Of course, there are other things tied together with this. It's also true that warmer places tended to have more pro-business policies after World War II. It's also true that they have had much more pro-housing policies. You do not understand the growth of Atlanta, Dallas, Houston, and Phoenix without understanding that they make it incredibly easy to mass produce massive amounts of housing. That doesn't mean that Detroit's problems would be solved if it made it easier to build, not at all. But if you have demand over a certain level, Right? The ease of supply becomes hugely important. Uh, this is the same fact for Europe, so this is not just a US phenomenon. The big difference, of course, is that in Europe, the coldest regions are actually losing people, not just, not just standing still. Um, along with the move to sun was the move to sprawl. We have always built our living spaces around the transportation technologies that were dominant in the age in which they were being created. Go to the oldest European cities, go to the oldest parts of Boston and New York, you find classic water, walking cities, short blocks, narrow streets, roads that often wind, reflecting the way that human beings walk. Right? Then you move to cities that are built around streetcars or built around the early horse-drawn omnibuses. Those have to be gridded, because once you have wheeled transportation being the norm, you ha can't have so many uh, twists and turns. On top of that, you need streets that are somewhat larger. Then you have you know, suburbs that were made possible by rail in the late 19th century. And then, of course, you have the car. Right? And of course, we have rebuilt our cities around, rebuilt our world around the car. Um, in some sense, that's not surprising. The average commute by car in this country is 24 minutes. The average commute by public transportation is 48 minutes, right? It's not surprising that Americans love the automobile, and it's not surprising that we rebuilt our infrastructure around it. Of course, we have also artificially subsidized the car. And as an economist, I actually believe strongly that people should have choices, but I also believe that the federal government shouldn't be bribing people to live in one particular area, shouldn't be artificially encouraging people to drive by subsidizing highways with general tax revenues something that this administration has been particularly fond of doing. Um, the, the work of Nathaniel Baum Snow finds that each new highway that cuts into a metropolitan area core after World War II is associated with an 18% decline in the central city population relative to the metropolitan area as a whole. These highways were deeply harmful for the growth of, of cities relative to metro, outside metropolitan areas, according to this, according to this work. Um, now, hit by the move to sun and sprawl, hit by deindustrialization, this is what happened to America's cities in the post-war world. Right? Detroit is on fire in 1967. Right? It seemed as if civilization, which was a product of our cities, had fled those urban areas. This is what happened to the population of the 10 largest American cities in 1950. Actually, Milwaukee's is remarkably stable. 
relative to the majority of these. Eight of these, eight of these cities lost 20% more of their population. Three of them lost 50% or more of their population, Cleveland, Detroit, and St. Louis. Right? These are, of course, cities, not metropolitan areas. And almost all the other facts that I've shown you are actually about metropolitan areas. But, so this decline reflects both suburbanization and sprawl and also the decline of the older industrial heartland. But they're staggering numbers. Um, Milwaukee's story is, has a lot to do with actually annexation through the 1950s. And the relative, the 50s, Milwaukee is one of the few older, colder cities that is actually adding population. That's also partially a reflection of the desire to be part of Milwaukee's water district. And I'll come back to that later. But Milwaukee's pioneering role in, in sewers and water, water handling is actually one of the glories of the city's, city's past. Um, now, the federal government responded to urban decline. But its response made a crucial mistake, which is to confuse the real city, which is always the people living in the city, with the structures and infrastructure of the city. It's not that people don't need structures and infrastructure, but the hallmark of declining cities is that they have an abundance of structures and infrastructure relative to the level of demand. You didn't need federal subsidies for building urban renewal projects in the 50s and 60s. You certainly don't need support for building new projects in declining cities today. More than 90% of the homes in central city Detroit, even in 1980, were priced significantly below construction costs. Right? If you built them, no one would be willing to put them up without massive subsidies. You, don't, you didn't need new homes to be built in, in Detroit. And you certainly didn't need a people mover monorail to glide over essentially empty streets. It's like a Simpsons episode, right? This is what they built after the Federal Highway Aid Act of 1973 funneled federal dollars for transportation projects in America's cities, right? It's easy to get around downtown Detroit, right? It's a city built for 1.85 million people that now has less than half that amount, right? You don't need something like this, and yet, because of the magic that is so often associated with rail projects, because of the magic that can be said, oh, if only we had this thing, Detroit would be back. You get this sort of thing. It's a folly called the edifice complex, right? It's a folly of thinking that you just put up fancy structures and all of a sudden you can declare Cleveland is, has come back. But it hasn't come back. It hasn't come back unless the kids are being better educated, unless entrepreneurship is going strong. It's not about the structures unless the structures are serving the, a purpose. Now, the story, of course, of declining cities does not end there. Detroit's still, of course, in trouble, but many of America's cities have come back. None, perhaps, more spectacular than Seattle, which actually in the last year was the fastest growing large city in, in America, somewhat amazingly. Um, now, um, in Seattle, in 1971, two jokers put up a billboard outside the city asking the last person to leave Seattle to please turn out the lights. Uh, because Seattle had, was in trouble. Boeing, mighty Boeing, was cutting back on the number of jobs. And just as no one could imagine a Detroit with a smaller General Motors, no one could imagine a Seattle with a smaller Boeing. This is before Amazon, before Costco, before Microsoft. And Starbucks is just a faint whiff of a caffeinated aroma. It came back not because of some large public project. It came back because of private sector entrepreneurship built on the back of a very well-educated workforce. Right? That's what happened with Seattle. Boston's comeback is, is strongly associated with the education industry. And I'm somewhat sad to admit the key player in this economic comeback is not my university, but that other one uh, down the Charles River called MIT. Um, the work of Enrico Moretti at Berkeley finds that those cities that were lucky enough to have a land-grant college prior to 1940 have done much, much better than those cities without a land-grant college. Boston's land-grant college is MIT, right? College supported with federal, federal land-grant aid. And these are two of the people who epitomize the ability of MIT to connect with business world. This is Vannevar Bush, founder of Raytheon, great American scientist, scholar, the mentor of the young Fred Terman, who came from Stanford and learned this model from Van Bush, and then took it back before becoming provost at Stanford and starting Stanford Industrial Park, the heart of Silicon Valley. Right? He is a guy who epitomizes the connection between the university and the business world. This is um, Arthur D. Little. It's actually not Arthur D. Little himself. I couldn't find a non-copyrighted picture of Arthur D. Little. Uh, this is the Arthur D. Little building at, at MIT. Arthur D. Little is the founder uh, of the management consulting industry and, uh, in Boston. The guys at McKinsey always love it when you remind them of that. But Arthur D. Little is the guy, the MIT chemist, who you know, builds a research lab for uh, General Motors and really starts this ball rolling. These are two examples of entrepreneurs who leap from the university to areas around them. And, um, Indeed, the work of my student Naomi Hausman finds that after the Bayh-Dole Act allows the commercialization of university research in 1980, there's a huge explosion 
of related economic activity near these universities. And this is not just about MIT, this is about U Montana Bozeman, right? It's, it's, the, whole, it's the whole range. Um, the related fact, of course, is that if you ask yourself what is the variable that best predicts which of these older, colder cities have come back and which ones have not, it is education. This is across the entire US, 2000 to 2010, the relationship between share of the population with a college degree in 2000 and subsequent population growth. Very strong positive relation there. If you want to ask yourself why Seattle looks incredibly different from uh, Detroit, remember that 12% of Detroit's population is a college degree and over 50% of Seattle's population has a college degree. Skills are destiny, right? They're destiny also at the national level. This is the relationship between skills and earnings. This relationship is not just the, the the relationship that would be predicted by the normal tendency of skilled people to earn six or seven percent more per year. This relationship is stronger because of something economists call human capital externalities. The fact that we get more productive by having smart people around us. The fact that by having smart neighbors, we have people who could potentially employ us, who can give us ideas that we can steal, right? Who can actually make us more productive. Uh, the fact is that as the share of adults in your metropolitan area with a college degree goes up by 10%, your wages go up on average by 8%, holding your years of schooling constant, okay? It really pays to have smart neighbors. This is across countries, the relationship between mass scores and earnings, uh, also strongly positive. Now, the one industry that's associated with urban success in many countries, and I have to just really move quickly on this, is, is finance. And in some sense, we shouldn't be surprised by this because there's no industry in which being a little bit smarter can make you a fortune more quickly than finance. If you think that the great advantage of urban density in the 21st century is the ability to spread ideas, the fact that we learn more quickly from people if we're next to each other, then it is not surprising that finance loves destiny, density. Now, this is the Bloomberg's, um, uh, the Wallace office at Bloomberg City Hall. And I show this picture for three reasons. One of which is it reminds us that there was a chain of creativity in finance, kind of like the same one that exists in 15th century Florence, right? A more sophisticated ability to think about risk and return, which is then enables the young Michael Milken to start the junk bond industry, and those junk bonds then enable the young Henry Kravis to engage in larger and larger leveraged buyouts, getting value out of companies like RJR and Nabisco. Bloomberg is part of this chain. His data terminals are part of a more sophisticated approach to financial products. The second reason I like this picture is it's, an, it's a it's evidence for what Jane Jacobs talked about in the economy of cities, of the ability of cities to enable cross-industry leaps. Because Bloomberg is not a financial billionaire. He's an information technology billionaire. But he's able to succeed in information technology because he has knowledge that no computer programmer sitting in splendor in Atherton could possibly have. Right? Because he has knowledge the city has given him. Because he's run the trading floor at Solomon Brothers. Because he's run their tech operation. And when he becomes an entrepreneur on his own, he knows what the guys at Merrill Lynch want on his desk. He has the wisdom that the city has given him. Third reason I like this. Notice any walls there? It's a Wallace office, right? Which is based on the Wallace office at Bloomberg LLP, which is based on the Solomon Brothers trading floor. Now here is something of a puzzle. Here we have some of the most successful people on the planet who any normal industry would live like you know, university presidents and have vast offices protected by giant oaken desks and executive assistants. And here they are in a trading floor, all on top of each other sweating on each other, getting guacamole on each other, if Michael Lewis is to be believed, right? Why are they doing it? Why are they putting up with all this proximity? Well, of course, they're putting up with the proximity because knowledge is more, so important in their industry, because knowledge is more important than space. And in some sense, that's why cities came back. And that takes us back to the puzzle with which I began this talk, that what's happened over the past 30 years is that knowledge has become much more important than space. What globalization and new technologies have done is they have radically increased the returns to being smart. Because you can sell it on the other side of the planet, because you can source it on the other side of the planet. And we are a social species that gets smart by being around other smart people. It is our greatest asset, right? It's the fact that we come out of the womb with this remarkable ability to pick up information from our parents, from our peers, from our siblings, even occasionally from our teachers, right? This is what cities do that really matters. This is why face-to-face -face contact really matters. Anyone who's ever taught knows the hard part about teaching is not knowing your subject material. It's knowing whether or not anything you're saying is sinking in. And we have evolved over millions of years to have these cues for communicating comprehension or confusion that are lost when we're not in the same room with one another. That's why a more complicated world requires more face-to-face -face contact and also requires cities. Um,
Technologies like Zipcar play into this. Zipcar emphasizes that it's the rise of the sharing economy. Well, guess what? Cities have always been about sharing, right? What is an urban restaurant but a shared uh, dining room and a shared kitchen? What is an urban park other than a shared backyard? But the great thing about technologies like Zipcar is that it enables you to share more stuff. The reason why you couldn't have Zipcar in New York in the 1970s is you'd go to pick up the car on like a Sunday morning and there'd be like a dead body in the trunk. Right? And you wouldn't know who shot it, who had it last, you wouldn't be able to figure it out. Now you know, and that's the glory of the Zipcar technology. Okay, on top of education, right, the, the formal education that universities do is important, but it's surely much less important than the wisdom that's learned on the street. By what Alfred Marshall, the great English economist, was talking about 120 years ago when he said that in, in dense clusters, the mysteries of the trade become no mystery, but are, as it were, in the air. Right? There's no skill or talent that's more important for rebuilding a city than the in inclination to be an entrepreneur, the ability to become an entrepreneur. 50 years ago, the economist Ben Chinnis was comparing New York and Pittsburgh and found that New York was more uh, resilient than Pittsburgh, and he claimed that this was a result of New York's culture of entrepreneurship, a culture that was created by a legacy of the garment district. The fact that this was an industry that anyone with a good idea and a couple of sewing machines could get started in. New Pittsburgh, by contrast, had US Steel, right? Great industry for the short run, but it trained company men, not entrepreneurs. And those company men were far less resilient, far less able to reuse their human capital in different ways. It is remarkable, given how crappy our measures of entrepreneurship are, how good a job they do at predicting urban growth and resilience. This is average establishment size, which is one of the, one of the measures we use. The, the ones are the places with lots of little firms. The fives are the places with really big firms in 1977. As you can see, huge employment growth differences between the places with little firms and big firms. This is true within industries. This is true across industries. Now, um, entrepreneurship is great. The harder problem, actually, from the urban perspective is figuring out how to, how to boost it. And I skipped over something. I'm going to skip over a lot now. Most entrepreneurial place I've ever been in the world is the slum of Dharavi in Mumbai. Right? You walk down the streets, and there's just so much human talent figuring out amazing new ways to make money, a ceramics cluster where they're making pots that are so beautiful, they're not willing to take any money from you. And down further on, there are guys who are recycling boxes, which means chopping them up and turning them around so you can't see the old labels. Who knew there was money in this? But you know, the city taught them somehow. And then you go outside in the street, and you see a kid defecating in an unpaved road. And you know the water is bad to drink, and you know the electricity is uncertain, and it reminds you that there are also demons that come with density. If two people are close enough to give each other an idea face to face, they're also close enough to give each other a contagious disease. And for thousands of years, cities have been battling these demons of density. This is why people who live in cities like government more than people who don't live in cities. They need government more. They need government to manage these downsides of density. Um, the most important of these demons is contagious disease, which is why the most important job of city government is clean water. Right? A boy born in 1900 in New York could expect to live seven years less than the national average. Right? Today, life expectancy is three years longer in New York. That switch only happened with the decline of diseases like cholera, which you see killing people here. That decline was intimately tied to the cleaning up of our water supplies. This didn't happen on the cheap. America's cities and towns were spending as much on clean water at the start of the 20th century as the federal government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army. It was an incredibly expensive and important undertaking. Milwaukee was huge in this. Milwaukee was a huge player in this. Sewers, water, you handle primarily with just engineering. Other things require economics. You can't just build your way out of traffic congestion because of something that's called the fundamental law of highway traffic, which is that vehicle miles traveled increase roughly one for one with highway miles built. This is the work of Gilles Duranton and Matthew Turner. Right? If you build it, they will drive it. Okay, so unless you actually start charging people to use roads, unless you do what Singapore has been doing since 1975 and actually using electronic road pricing so that people pay for the social costs of their actions, right, you won't get roads being used properly. Um, if cities are able to deal with these downsides of density, they can become places of remarkable pleasure as well as productivity. Um, this requires safety, this requires uh, clean water, this requires traffic handling. Of course, one downside of succeeding too much is if you don't build enough housing, you risk becoming a boutique town that's affordable only to the wealthy. The declining line is new permits in New York. The rising line is rising prices. Just when New York got its act together as a center of the information economy, as a place of pleasure, it made it more and more difficult to build. The result is that New York became incredibly expensive. This is the thing Jane Jacobs, who was in so many ways a peerless, a peerless analyst of urban life, got wrong. She looked at old buildings and noted that they were cheap. And she looked at new buildings and she noted they were expensive, which, concluded, which made her conclude that she thought that the way to promote affordability was to make sure that no one built any new buildings on top of old buildings. Right? That's not how supply and demand works. That's not economics 101. If you stop new building in areas that are high demand, right, 
you are ensuring high prices, not the opposite. And you don't have to look any further than her own home area of the Greenwich Village, which she fought so hard to freeze in amber in the Greenwich Village Historic Preservation District to see what happens when you freeze supply in high demand areas. Townhouses there, which were affordable to ordinary Americans when she lived there in the 1950s, now start at $8 million, right? They're old, but they ain't cheap. Okay, I'm gonna skip over this, I'm gonna skip over this. Now, one final point. Um, one of the reasons why it is important to have policies that are friendly to cities is because of the environment. It is often true, and I, I associate, I call this the Lorax fallacy. It is often thought that cities are somehow or other the enemies of the environment. The opposite is in fact true. The cities are in fact intrinsically green. And I'm gonna make this point with an anecdote about a young Harvard College graduate who in a beautiful spring day in 1844 went for a walk in the woods outside of Concord, Massachusetts. And he did a little fishing, and the fishing was good because there hadn't been much rain lately. But when he came to cook the fish into a chowder, that's what we do in Massachusetts, we cook chowders, right? The wind flicked the flames to the nearby dry grass. And a fire started and it spread. And by the time it was done, it had burned down more than 300 acres of prime woodland. In his own day, it was castigated as an enemy of the environment. The conquered freeman called him a flippity gibbet, which I think was pretty bad for 1844. And surely they were right, or at least they had a point. I can't think of any young man in 1844 who did as much damage to the environment as this character did. Of course, today, he is revered as the secular saint of American environmentalism. His name is Henry David Thoreau. His book, Walden, is seen as a gospel of what a wonderful thing it is to live surrounded by nature. Um, I have trouble not reading a different moral into his life, right? Uh, uh, at least I read the story of the fire as reminding us that we are a very destructive species. And if you love nature, it often makes sense to stay away from it. As indeed, Thoreau would have done a great deal of good for nature if he had stayed at home in Cambridge instead of cooking chowders in the woods outside of Concord. Now, uh, this is a point that I know from my own life and from my research with Matthew Kahn, which has evaluated carbon emissions in different parts of, of the country. And we find that typically people who live in dense urban areas are much kinder in carbon emissions than people who live in, in sprawling areas because of two things. One of which is that they have, people have smaller houses or smaller apartments in urban areas, even holding income and family size constant. And secondly, it's just the length of distances that you travel. So short commutes versus long commutes. I know this personally because about 10 years ago, not 10 years, eight years ago when I started acquiring small children, uh, only economists talk about acquiring small children. Uh, I moved from about here to about here and started doing about as much damage to the environment as Thoreau himself did, what with the heating the house in the winter and the, the driving and such. Um, and it's not as if I'm in any sense, I wanna just be very clear about this, as opposed to sort of many, you know, advocates, I'm an economist, I believe in choice. I think it is fantastic that America has different options about where to live. I think that there are plenty of people who love living surrounded by woods and God bless them, they should live surrounded by woods, right? Great cities have you know, lots of neighborhood choices. Um, and the answer for the environment is not that we should be trying to shoehorn people into one type of life, it is that we should charge people for the social costs of their actions, right? That that's, that that's in fact what we should want to do, is we should charge people for the appropriate cost of, of traffic congestion or other costs. And when we think about how to rethink our cities, right, and I think some of that is relevant, because if the great growing cities of India and China, the great growing economies of India and China reach the carbon emissions levels seen in the sprawling United States, global carbon emissions go up by 130%. If they stop at the level seen in wealthy but hyperdense Hong Kong, global carbon emissions go up by less than 30%. Now, I'm not a climate scientist. I have no personal view on what the you know, size of the externality is from that. But whether or not you're worried about climate change or the price of gas at the pump, you've got a lot to wish for China and India building up rather than, rather than out. And I think the right answer for the US is not to try and socially manage people, but to rethink those policies that hold urban areas back. One of those I've already alluded to, which is transportation policies that essentially bribe people to drive by paying for highways with general tax revenues. A second is policies that artificially subsidize home ownership, that bribe people through the home mortgage interest deduction, through subsidized mortgages, through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, to move to larger houses that are often leveraged to the hilt, right, that tend to build as much of a bankruptcy society as an ownership society, right? And given the strong correlation between ownership type and structure type, more than 85% of single family detached houses are owner occupied, more than 85% of multifamily housings are rented. By pushing people away from rentals into ownership, you're pushing people away from high density living. And finally, and most importantly, the issue of our city schools. Right? Which above all, it's not a federal problem, it's a local problem, it requires local entrepreneurship to fix. But the problems of American city schools do not have to be. There are many places in the world in which people come to cities to get better education. Right? And yet, for decades, we have, our city school systems have hobbled 
our cities and, and caused an excess of suburbanization. And this is, you know, to me, this is in some sense one of the great social justice issues of America. That we need to figure out ways to make sure that every child anywhere gets a better schooling. And I think when I, you hear me rail about the monorail in, in Detroit, what kills me about the monorail, right, is the, mon the people mover, is that that money could have been spent on the children. That move, money could have been spent in ways that actually promoted economic opportunity. Because at their heart, right, cities are about people. And I don't want to end on any sort of a black note, right? I don't want to end on any sort of, of a downside on this, right? Because in fact, as difficult as these challenges are, the track record of humanity to work miracles when they're connected by each other in cities is just fantastic. And for all of you who work to make this city stronger and to connect with one another, I thank you. Because these really are humanity's greatest invention. And we think about the best solutions for the future, they're going to come out of cities. Thank you. Ooh. Went on a little long, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for a, for a great talk. Uh, we have a few minutes uh, for a, a few questions, so if you, if you have a question, please uh, move towards uh, one of the microphones, and, and uh, we will uh, uh, take I'm the questions. I'm a faculty member. You know, I can also cold call people if you want me, if you want me to. The, uh... <laughs> this will be on the, uh, the quiz a little bit later on today. So. Uh... One of the fundamental principles of your argument is about the exchange of ideas and proximity. Uh, could you speak to the World Wide Web and how proximity doesn't always necessitate, necessitate exchange of ideas? Thank you. That's a great question, something that I've been working on for 20 odd years. Um, the, um, the, the, it, it's certainly a reasonable question whether or not electronic interaction is a substitute or a complement, to use electronic words, economist words with face-to-face -face interaction. And certainly 20 years ago, Right? It was unclear whether or not electronic interactions would make cities, cities obsolete and face-to-face -face contact obsolete. I think the track record now seems to suggest very much the opposite. And let me sort of give you the, 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 at least some more examples. I talked a little bit about how the, the, you know, my view that what was happening from the World Wide Web is it increased the returns to new ideas and innovation, and this increased the returns to connecting with one another. But let's get tangible about this. Let's talk Google. Right? You can't get more World Wide Web than Google. Right? And if you think that there was a company that would be good at decentralizing employment, at just telling its guys, you know, go, go ahead, work at home. You know, we don't need you around. You have fantastic ways of connecting with each other over the internet. After all, we're Google. They would be the ones that do it. Is that what Google does? Of course not. It's exactly the opposite. They build the Googleplex. They try to get their guys to show up 24-7. Right? They get rid of any barriers to people connecting with each other because they understand that this is how innovation works. Right? This is why Marissa Meyer at Yahoo right, bans telecommuting. Right? She wants her, her people in there because this is where creativity comes from. So uh, I don't see anything that suggests to me, and this was much less obvious when I first, I mean, I first wrote about this in literally 1994. I, I think it was much less obvious there because it really looked as if this sort of hangover of transportation costs reducing the demand for cities looked like it might, have, might fall over for the other stuff. But I think the declining information costs have just created an incredibly information intensive world, whether or not that's in Bangalore or in Silicon Valley or in Milwaukee. And, you know, that's a world that commands face-to-face -face contact. It's really very similar to the university as well, right? I mean, people talk about whether or not, you know, will this long-distance learning, will things like Khan Academy make the experience of a university like you know, Marquette obsolete? And I just think that's utter nonsense because, in fact, nothing replaces this incredibly information-rich thing of being surrounded by really smart people that you get to learn from. And let's be clear, I'm not talking about faculty here. Right. Uh, the, the really important thing in a college education is the learning that happens student to student. And that's, that's the magic. It's just sort of cramming smart people together. And if, fac and if a faculty member is effective, they're able to somehow or other move the topic of conversation to something that, you know, that they care about. They're not actually going to be the, the fully educated itself. They're just going to hopefully inspire. Um, any, other, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm thinking like the end of this would be people in the cities manufacturing, making stuff, learning stuff, and then the rural parts would be agriculture, growing food. So can you t is that kind of what you're talking about? And then what about urban agriculture? Can you just talk about that a little bit? Sure, I can talk about that a little bit. So I think there's always going to be, I, I don't think, again, just to be clear on this, I don't believe that the solution at all either should be or will be one size fits all in terms of people's living, right? Humanity has wonderful, varied tastes. Mm -hmm. 
and there will continue to be lots of people who will like small town life and who will like living in low density areas. And that's great as long as people are paying for the, for the price of their actions. Manufacturing um, of traditional goods uh, is fundamentally not an urban pursuit in the 21st century. Right? It's a pursuit that's land intensive, that doesn't require a huge amount of creativity. We've deindustrialized most of our large cities. Milwaukee is somewhat remarkable in that 10% of the labor force in Milwaukee County is still in manufacturing. Um, but the and there still is a room, of course, for creative manufacturing, for manufacturing around, you know, Boston's largest manufacturing industry is bakeries, and that's not going to go away. Uh, but for ordinary goods, there's no reason for this stuff to be urban. It's not information intensive and it is land intensive. Bad, bad thing to put, in, to put in cities. It will still be American, although but American manufacturing tends to be very machine intensive rather than labor intensive at this, at this point in time. Um, even the manufacturing industries that you now see in places like Shenzhen in China, I believe very strongly that's not a permanent set, set of affairs. That's a temporary set of affairs you know, where manufacturing will continue to de-urbanize. Um, rural agriculture, surely. Agriculture is even more intensive in land than, uh, than uh, uh, manufacturing is, and that's, that's of course what happens in, low, in lots of low-density low areas. Um, but in terms of urban agriculture, so I think there are a couple of things to think about, one of which is the extent to which we're thinking about what to do with land in declining cities like Detroit. Right? I think urban agriculture is a perfectly reasonable thing to think about. I think if you think about urban agriculture in places where land is very expensive, you want to think about it primarily as an educational tool. I mean, when I think about sort of my, my friends who are advocates for urban agriculture in Boston, the best case I can see for it is that somehow or other you're connecting people with the land in various ways and teaching them stuff about, about things. As an actual sensible economic decision, or in fact sensible environmental decision, if you're just doing it based on dollars and cents, urban agriculture in high value areas doesn't really work. And I'll just make the, I, I won't belabor the economic decision, but it's the environmental point that's actually stronger to make. Because in fact, anything that increases the amount of space between people right, is really bad environmentally. Because it involves moving people is incredibly energy intensive relative to moving, go moving goods or moving agriculture. So it's just a whole lot easier to move tomatoes in terms of how much carbon is required than it is to increase the amount of space between people and cities. So if you, if you like urban agriculture in the sense that you think it's a great thing for kids to be exposed to gardens, then God bless you. That's a perfectly reasonable part of a 21st century city, which after all, we want to be green, right? We want to have things that make you happy about living in the city. We want trees, we want plants. If you want urban agriculture because you're trying to figure out what to do with Detroit and you've got a lot of land that you've got to make you know, humane in some ways, then absolutely, that makes sense. If you think that actually large-scale urban agriculture is an effective either economic or environmental tool, there uh, I'm more dubious. Yes. I have a question over here. Um, speaking about moving people, how do you feel about uh, China's um, recent uh, population shift moving to uh, cities from, uh, like, say, northwestern uh, provinces, and um, just in general about what your take on a hukou reform? Look, I like freedom. Right? I mean, so uh, I'm not a big fan of the, the hukou system essentially creates a barriers on Chinese mobility. And if you do move to Shanghai, right, you do move to a successful city, you essentially become a second, uh, a second class citizen within, within Shanghai. Now, it's better to have people and able to be moved as migrants than not at all. But it's sort of deeply unfair and counter to sort of either American or at this point European notions of the value of people's freedom and being able to, being able to move. Uh, I believe strongly that China is doing the right thing by urbanization. There are, of course, massive environmental issues with the way that China, China is urbanizing. But um, you know, that's the, the standard environmental Kuznets curve. When places develop, they tend to get, tend to get worse environmentally because, before they get better. But it's something we should continue to worry about in terms of China urbanizing. Uh, I think there are a lot of other issues about China's urbanizing. I'll just highlight two, one of which is urbanization has tend to be a, a tool for political change and often dem democratization. Think of the sort of connections that were made in Boston in the 1770s between John Hancock, who wanted a change in Britain's mercantilist policies, and Sam Adams, who knew how to conjure a crowd, like many who were involved in the, in the liquor business. Uh, so uh, this combination helped set off a chain of events that gave us this amazing republic of ours. Um, this is something that is worth watching in China. And it's parts it's worth watching because as much as I believe in democracy and freedom, we also know that urban uprisings can actually go in dangerous ways as well, right? The world of St. Petersburg in 1917 ended up in a place that was much less benign than, than Boston in 1776. Um, second thing, the, as much as I'm a fan of Chinese urbanization, once you get away from Shanghai and Beijing and you get into the interior and you walk through forests of empty skyscrapers that are built 
to a level of luxury that is unlike any place I've ever lived in my life, right? And you see that they are largely empty, right? And they seem totally mismatched for the level of wealth in the community around them, right? Um, you cannot help but worry whether or not China is headed for the mother of all real estate corrections, right? And that is something that is, I think, hard not to be anxious about, both because countries react to real estate contractions in strange and occasionally troublesome ways. Um, yes? Uh, so you're very hard on uh, freeway subsidies, which I think is justifiable, uh, but you're also uh, hard on the Detroit people mover uh, system. And yeah. The mass transit. But many of the examples you use, Boston, New York, otherwise, um, have a great mass transit uh, systems. So while we do our own mass transit planning here uh, in Milwaukee, what is your perspective on how, you know, what, what do we look for and what do we do to make sure we're on the, the Boston side of things and not the Detroit side? So you look for, I mean, I'm not going to make any particular statement about any particular infrastructure project in Milwaukee. All I'm going to make is a universal claim that cost-benefit analysis is a fantastic tool. Use it, right? Uh, it's, you know, you don't, you don't want to do anything without fairly rigorous cost-benefit analysis of any project. Now, I will also just say in terms of public transit, I actually believe strongly in public transit, but I have also been informed by, you know, 40 years of, there's an old line that 40 years of transportation economics at Harvard can be boiled down to four words. Bus, good, train, bad. Okay, and the reason for that are, are multiple. One of which is just the straight cost differences, particularly at moderate density levels between trains and buses. I mean, it's orders of magnitude in terms of the differences in cost. Secondly, buses are flexible. Right? If you put down a train network, you actually have to figure out what you think demand will be years before it shows up. Buses, you can adjust. You can move things around. You can react to changing circumstances. Right? Buses can also be upgraded regularly in terms of technology. Now, it is a tragedy that America has made buses the ugly stepchild of our transportation system. They don't need to be. Buses can be beautiful. Buses can have great technology in them. Buses can have social engineering, can have fun chat rooms in them. There are lots of cool things that you can do with buses, but not if you treat them as being, you know, this end of the road transportation for people that you don't care about, right? I mean, buses are important and valuable and useful. And um, certainly my, you know, the usual statement is about any reasonably sized, mid-sized city that it doesn't look like Shanghai, that, you know, investing in buses makes sense. Because there's really not a lot that you can do with a rail that you can't do with a bus on a dedicated lane, right? And this is, you know, the miracle of Curitiba in Brazil or uh, the Transmilenio in Colombia. These are bus rapid transit systems that are providing mobility at a fraction of the cost of incredibly expensive rail systems. And, you know, I, I admit it drives me crazy when I go through the developing world and I see vast amounts of money that were spent on underground systems that are too expensive for poor people to use, and that money could have been spent on schooling. And yes, you're right, I do, I do care deeply about it. But invest in public transit, no question about it, but be smart about it. You know, adhere to cost-benefit analysis and never forget that there's just a lot to like about buses. Yes, sir. Oh, he's next. We'll, yes, sir. We'll, we'll do two more questions and then, uh, and then call it a night. Do you have any comments on the difference between the way that big Texas cities have developed versus the way the eastern cities have developed and what seems to be the future? You know, I think that these are, Texas cities are cities that are built around the car. They're, they're you know, natural car cities. And, and some of them have been fairly tightly planned, like the Woodlands outside of Texas, which has a single company, George Mitchell's, Mitchell's company, that, that plans it out. Um, East Coast cities were traditional monocentric cities built around a core downtown area that occurred in an era of public transportation and walking. They have a very different feel. It is a great thing that America has both because different people like different stuff. Personally, you know, I've always lived in, in East Coast cities apart from, and Chicago, which is sort of the same model, apart from one year in Palo Alto. It, it is certainly what I love and what I feel comfortable for, but I would be a fool not to see the, you know, the great assets of Texas cities as well, right? I mean, Houston provides affordable housing for vast numbers of Americans in a way that is unthinkable in Boston or New York or San Francisco. There's a lot to like about that. Right? There's a lot to like. There's no surprise that you know so many Americans have chosen Houston and Dallas and Atlanta and Phoenix, right? Because in fact they are providing a standard of living for middle-class Americans that is unthinkable in New York or Boston or San Francisco, mostly because of the low cost of housing, but also because of you know a variety of other things that just make living easier. These are very functional places. So I, I think a net that America should you know take pride in the fact that it has both. Right? The competition between these, these areas are good. Right now, there's certainly this, you know, I mean, places that feel like they have core downtowns, historical paths are, are cool at the moment, right? But 
and, and that's great. You know, I, 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 I'm rooting for that. But on the other hand, you know, the growth of Detroit and Dallas is not ending. Uh, the growth of sorry, Houston and Dallas is not ending. And those are, those are places that you know, will continue to have a, a fairly robust future, I, I think. Uh, yes. I found your comment uh, where you said that cities attract poor people for very logical reasons. And I understand that made sense. But the thing that occurred to me is that it also creates huge stresses for cities. And uh, I think that's one of the things we're dealing with right now, even to the point where Milwaukee is sometimes vilified in other parts of this state because of the concentration of poverty. So how do we manage that? How do we really uh, work our way around that? You're, you're right. And there is something, you know, um, uh, the fact that cities attract poor people absolutely puts stresses on cities. It puts added expenses that are required on a variety of social services. It makes things harder for city budgets. If I had my druthers, right, I would take anything that involves the cost of caring for the poor out of local budgets, right? I mean, sort of the ideal economic ideal. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the poor of America are all of our responsibility. They're certainly not the responsibility of those people who happen to live down the block from them or happen to live within the same city. Um, so I would have redistribution, which includes paying for city services funded at a national level, and then you'd give some degree of local control as to how to actually spend that money. That certainly would be my ideal. Now, we, it, we aren't exactly about to have that, although, uh, so the, the question is how to make the argument that, um, you know, the, it's, it's uh, inappropriate not to, at least at the state level, not to transfer resources to somehow or other deal with the, the stresses of, of urban poverty. Um, I think the right argument is one about common decency. I think the right argument is that you know, uh, the, the social problems of the world belong to, belong to all of us. I'm not sure that's the one that I would use with a Republican legislature. Uh, and I say this as a moderate Republican, just to be honest. It's just not the argument that I would use. I think I would say something more about, uh, about the role, the economic function of, of cities in, in those arguments. But I think the real argument is that, in fact, you need larger scale. You, know, you need, you need broader, broader funding of local levels, and you can't expect you know, the neighbors to carry, carry everything. And the downside of requiring the neighbors to, 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 to carry everything is the rich just leave cities, right? I mean, if you try to sort of put all the burden, I mean, think about doing it at a block level. You'd have, you just have the, the rich segregating them, themselves. And that's, that's sort of a, a terrible thing to happen as well. So I think this is an ongoing fight in America to try and actually make sure that we have a better anti-poverty policy that we have. And the, the cities have a great role to play in that because they are laboratories for innovation. And they are places where we can try new policies. And I'll just mention this right now. One of my current ads is I'm co-chairing a, a committee with the economic development chief of Boston to design an innovation district for a high poverty area in Boston. And this is not what's what are called empowerment zones, where you actually use tax dollars to bribe people to move into poor areas. I think these are terribly, these are generally unwise ideas, that in fact you don't want to be bribing people to move into one area versus the other. It's a different model, which is we're going to experiment with things like one-stop permitting or vocational training by you know, a variety of providers that can potentially be scaled up. And to me, actually, that's what cities can do best in terms of anti-poverty stuff. It's not that they are good places to tax the rich and give to the poor. They're good places to try new things. They're good places to experiment because, in fact, our largest problem in dealing with the problems of poverty is not actually lack of funding, it's ignorance. We actually don't really know what works in dealing with this terrible problem of joblessness, and we need to have constant experimentation and innovation. And that's why cities are so precious, because they are the places where new ideas are created and can be tested at. <laughs>